the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Reflections by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The Wandering Baba Attended by a small band of disciples, Chara the Wandering Baba went on a journey visiting the many circles of dervishes which he had established in a number of countries. In Samarkand, the Baba gave a lecture to his followers and then spent several days separated from them, throwing tiny coins to all the children of the town, compelling them to dive into the river to retrieve them. The disciples were not pleased, and the people of the town exclaimed, The sooner this ignorant and ridiculous dervish quits our neighbourhood, the better. In Bokhara, the Baba gave out some teachings, then gathered the people together and told them jokes until the tears ran from their eyes. Some said, This is disgraceful for a man of faith, a teacher, and hakim. Others thought, if this is religion, let us laugh our way to paradise. In short, everyone in that city became addicted to jokes and pranks. In Badakhshan, the Baba initiated some followers, and then held classes in singing and dancing until everyone in that remote province became involved in nothing else. Some people approved, others were profoundly dismayed. When the party reached Kandahar, the Baba told everyone to stop writing and calligraphy, including illuminating manuscripts, until people bit their thumbs with horror and hoped that this disaster would soon pass over them. Soon, however, such was the power of the Baba's example and energy. Swimming became characteristic of Samarkand. Bokhara was the home of humour, and in Kandahar a school of painters and miniaturists grew up, because people had forgotten how to write. Twenty years later, Chara the Wanderer was dead. One of his disciples relates, I retraced the path which I had followed with my master, and it was thus that I realized what he had really been doing. When I was there, in Samarkand there was a terrible flood. Those grown men who had been children, taught swimming by the Babas making them dive for pennies, took the rest of the inhabitants on their backs, and in this way saved them. When I was in Bukhara, a cruel tyrant had seized the city. He was strutting about, trying to impose his will upon the people. But they, accustomed to laughing at everything because of the Baba's jokes, laughed at him so much that he had a fit of apoplexy and fell down dead. In Barakshan, a group of evil men, anxious to extend their sway over the populace, had just brought drugs to the province when I arrived. They said, Take these, and you will gain happiness and fulfilment. The people invariably answered them, We do not need your drugs, for we are already completely intoxicated with the dances and revels which the wandering Baba had brought us. In Kandahar, a usurper's edict demanded that all written records should be destroyed, so that all knowledge should seem to begin with his time. But the people, through the Babas having stopped them writing, had already long since committed all their learning to another form of communication. The ancient law was by now preserved in the designs on carpets, on ceramic tiles, in brasswork, embroidery, decoration of all kinds. Through the wandering Baba, all these people and these things had been saved. Unnecessary People who have organised their lives around the stability of relative ignorance regard all enterprises which do not fit in with their preconceptions as unnecessary. They seldom pause to think, of course, that unnecessary is the ideal term to preserve ignorance and especially timorousness. If the good Lord had expected us to fly, he would have given us wings. These are the very same people who would have called scientific research unnecessary if they couldn't understand it within their own logic system, but who would rush for antibiotics as soon as someone else had developed them. 
It is unnecessary for the monkey to start to believe that bananas could be cultivated, not just collected, because he is a monkey. It is unnecessary for the savage to question whether fire is not occasionally sent down from heaven by a thunder god, or whether he could make it, because he is a savage. It is unnecessary for a child to believe that we have to earn a living, because he is still a child, even if he has to grow up. It is unnecessary for the adult to believe that he needs intellectual education if he is a manual labourer. It is unnecessary for the educated man to believe that he may need a different or higher form of education, because he already defines his state as the best or highest. But nobody can stop the process of learning, real questioning, even if only because our ancestors started on this course many thousands of years ago. They set us on this course, and we cannot escape from it. Lying Look at the phenomenon of lying in its relationship to fools. Fools lie to explain or conceal their foolishness. It is not a remedy, but they use it. Liars again are fools, because a lie may be found out, and gambling fools are not different from the ordinary kind. The liar fools himself that he will not be found out, and the fool fools himself that his lie will cover his folly. It is not easy to avoid being a fool. It is possible to realise that one has been one. The remedy is not lying. Again, it is possible to realise that one has lied and to avoid it. Foolishness and lying being so much of a continuum, being truthful can help towards being less foolish. It is for this reason, because it is constructively useful, that traditional teachings have stressed the need to tell the truth and be as truthful as possible. Truthfulness means being efficient, effective. Lying is an attempt to make inefficiency into its opposite. This is why all forms of self-deception are lying, and the person who foolishly cannot see the truth can approach it by practice in avoiding, at least for a start, some forms of lying. Many durable, moralistic teachings are specific and effective exercises gone wrong. Doubt Doubt others and they will doubt you. Do not doubt them and they may still doubt you. Right and flattering Not this man or thing is right, but is it flattering me? Viability You can keep going on much less attention than you crave. Monstrous Suggestion A psychologist I know noticed that a certain company was promoting its products with techniques which made its advertising nothing less than a campaign of indoctrination. He observed the use of compelling rhythm and jingles, the tension and repetition in presentation, the breaking down of beliefs and the inculcation of new ones. Instead of challenging the firm directly, he thought that he would seek additional information. So he wrote to the head office and suggested that they might well care to profit from the application of knowledge of indoctrination to include in their advertising. Soon afterwards, a letter arrived, signed by the managing director. He was revolted by the suggestion that anyone should try to manipulate the freedom of choice of members of the public. Not only was it, in his view, immoral, but there was a code to help prevent it. How comforting to know that people in authority have set their faces firmly against such abuses. Lichen A piece of lichen was growing on a rock. In addition to the customary lichen thoughts, it often wondered why it could not spread so as to cover a part of the rock which was still bare. There is no lichen nutrient there, said the wisest part of the lichen and we must wait until it comes to us. As the years passed, the expectation of the mass of the lichen became stronger and stronger. Slowly, climatic changes caused the rock to split slightly. Certain chemicals were released and started to ooze outwards, covering a part of the bare surface of the stone. 
For the devout lichens, this was the answer to their prayers, and they gratefully spread themselves over the delicious food. Many years passed, and the chemicals began to become exhausted. This created changes in the character of the lichens, who attributed their difference in composition and being to profound social changes. Theoreticians multiplied, each with his explanation. The lichen philosophers, academics and scientists divided themselves into groups. You can imagine what their various explanations were like. Each version was based upon the interpretation of observed phenomena. In fact, of course, the theories were generally attempts to concentrate and spread personal convictions. Then, another chain of events caused someone to spill upon the rock another lichen nutrient, and the organisms were able to start growing again. This stimulus itself energized the theoreticians. Their increased anxieties in the immediate past had sharpened their mental activity. It had enabled them to realize the immediate cause of their reprieve and comparative abundance. But so far the lichens have not got to the point where they can fathom any perceptible intention behind the chain of causes which brings them the means to live and to expand. For this reason they have given up thinking about it. They believe nonetheless that they are thinking about it. But that is only because they are at the level of culture which regards the following statements as thought. Everything is accident. Everything is of supernatural origin. Some things are accident, some supernatural. I do not know what to think. I can believe, and therefore I can believe that mere opinion is the same as knowledge. I have inferred some things, therefore they are true. I have observed some things, therefore I can observe others. What cannot be observed can be inferred. What cannot be inferred can be felt. What cannot be observed, inferred, or felt cannot have any relevance to anything and is therefore nonsense. How fortunate that humanity is different from lichen. The Log and the Mushroom A rotten log was providing the nutrition for a growing mushroom. As the fungus burst its way through the wood, it shouted, Down with this restrictive institution trying to inhibit my freedom! Other growths, which were spectators, were much affected by the struggle. They said in admiration, How beautiful is the irresistible heroism of fungi! What a lesson for our descendants! Let us never forget this day. That log thought that it was strong. Indeed, had it not been for the unconquerable spirit of the mushrooms, none would have dared to conceive, let alone carry through such a glorious enterprise. Some toadstools, which had thrust their way with ease through leaf mould, said, All this effort, this boasting, surely it is unnecessary. But they were soon silenced in the rising clamour from the fungus chorus. Destroy, destroy, destroy tyranny, so that we may have harmony and peace. The Demon's Oath Once upon a time a certain demon overheard a pious man, saying, Oh, would that I could only be tempted so that I could show that I am impervious to the wiles of demons. The demon immediately materialized before the man and said, I am a demon, and I would like to take you on a pilgrimage to a holy shrine. A demon on a pilgrimage, said the pious man. This is surely something strange, but there can be no harm in going on a pilgrimage no matter what one's companion is like. To the demon he said, I know good from bad, and it will be no use tempting me, you know. The demon said, Friend, although I am a demon, all I ask of you is that during this pilgrimage you will do nothing harmful to any creature. Stranger and stranger, thought the pious man. Aloud he said, I will swear that on my oath, demon, for it entirely accords with my own philosophy. And said the demon. You will also have to swear that you will not kill, and that you will treat others with the utmost respect. Agreed, said the pious man, and if you are a demon you are the kind which I would most wish to meet, for it seems that you are already on the way to reformation. But if this is a trick, mark you, you will find that I am not susceptible to the wiles of the evil ones. Fine, 
said the demon, and they started on their way. At first halt, the demon said, What do you propose to eat? Meat, said the man. I will not permit that, said the demon, because you will be encouraging harm to living things. But it is not now living, said the man. By eating it, you are leaving a place for more meat to be demanded, and by causing meat to be demanded, you are causing butchers to kill, and this is causing harm to living things, said the demon. So the pious man gave up meat. At the next hold, the demon said, Why are you moving that thorn bush? The man said, So that I can sit down. I will not allow it, said the demon, for it will be causing harm to living things. How can that be so? asked the pious man. You have spent too much time in prayers for your own soul to notice that this bush is protecting the burrow of a rabbit, which will be left exposed to foxes if you take it away, said the demon. So the bush remained where it was. At the third halt, the demon said, What are you going to do? I'm going to light a fire, said the pious man. You may only do so if you can swear that it will not harm any living thing in the earth, said the demon. That night they slept without a fire. The following day they came to a town. A man was coming down the street, and the pious man thought, I will show this demon, who seems to make a mockery of me, that I remember what I promised about doing people honour. So he went up to the newcomer and kissed his hand. Immediately he was surrounded by infuriated local people who shouted, That man is a worshipper of the devil, and you show him honour! They seized the man and the demon and stoned them. When they were eventually released, they were within one day's march of their goal. The demon said to the pious man, Yonder lies the city of the shrine. I leave you here. Now enter it, and do good deeds if you dare. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.